Okay, first up, I need 25.3. I think I can trust the scale pretty well now. <laughs> so I moved that over, it just annihilated my meter. You know how when I had the sweep generator up, I was getting the uh, the response curve here. You know, if you don't have one, you could uh, use a fixed generator like this and a VTVM and actually rotate the dial yourself and plot out the points and you can build up the response curve like that. You can see how there's a hump in the response as I pass a certain range of frequencies and it drops back down. That's that same curve we saw earlier. Uh, so again we need 25.3 so there's 25 that's 25 and a half so 25.3 should be uh, right about there. And they want me to maintain an output of about one volt while doing this. So increase this a bit. Let's see, we're in the 1.5 range, so one. So right about there. And then the first call I want to adjust is a six, which is. Uh, this guy, this whole center section here on its own little module here. This is a video IF strip. This is a six. All right. Oh, that was off a bit. Unless somebody monkeyed with this set, the, the coils generally would be in pretty much in the right position, but uh, if you start replacing resistors, capacitors, putting new tubes in there, yeah, you really do need to go through and do an alignment to get the full performance out of your set. Same goes for radios. Alright, that's that. Yeah, we need 23.5. Between 23 and 24, and a 7, which is uh, this guy way up here. Got the tight in here. too much. Because they suggest I keep my levels low enough that I'm down here on the scale. Alright. Well, you get the idea. I'll finish up the next few steps and then resume recording. This last adjustment is a little bit different than the others. This is for the 4.5 megahertz trap. That's to keep the audio out of getting into the video, I believe. So to do that, I actually popped out uh, V304 and fed the signal directly into pin seven there. And I have my VTVM lead going to pin 8 on the video amp and I'm supposed to adjust it for a minimum in other words we don't want any of the 4.5 megahertz signal getting through so I got my RF generator right on 4.5 and it's going through a capacitor right into the tube I pulled out and then my meter in AC mode is going to the video output tube and I need to adjust this last coil way down here by that tube socket I pulled out. 
and just that for a minimum. But definitely wasn't right the way it was. So minimum. Alright. Uh, there. Alright, now that is it. So now I'm going to pull all this stuff out, put this up back the way it would be normally in operation and see how it works. Now notice we didn't use a sweep generator to do any of the alignment work. Well for this particular set, these Admiral sets with the stagger tuned setup, you don't need a sweep generator to perform the alignment steps. The only thing you really need it for is to check the overall response curve, which I'll be doing after I check out the set. Cause to be honest, I want to see how the set plays without going through and actually looking at this waveform, but I will. And that's when I'm going to pull out my other sleep generators too and see which one gives me the best representation of this curve. I removed all the temporary components I'd put in place while doing the alignment. I put the shields back on, including all the tube shields. So let's power this up. And see if all that work actually did me any good. Doing an alignment may seem intimidating at first, but as long as you have decent instructions and some decent equipment, which is not at all expensive, you can get one of these and one of these for not a whole lot of money on eBay. Just make sure that they're calibrated functioning correctly. Alright, so here we got static. Uh, I got channel six. Well, that looks promising. It sounds promising so far. Huh. How about that? Good picture and good sound at the same time. So now when I tune off a bit from the center on the fine tuning, I lose sound and the picture gets a bit blurry. Oh, yeah. Sharp picture and good sound at the same time. Definitely looking good. Alright. Now there still are a couple trimmers I have not touched, and those are right up here front around the oscillator mixer tube itself. For that, I do need to use the sleep generator, and that's to check that overall response curve, which is this whole suction here. So that is coming up next. But uh, so far, even just as things are right now, I'm quite happy, much better than it was when I started. I've got my sleep generator hooked up again to show the overall IF response curve. And this time I inverted both the X and the Y axis, so that curve should match this curve precisely. And as you can see, they don't. But all's not bad. There are two key frequencies they show on there. On the right, at 21.25, where the uh, audio trap is, it should be a, a null and a pretty sharp drop off to that point. On the other side, a gradual curve and a 50% respond point at 25.75. So, I've got my variable marker generator set up. It's that moving blob there. So let's dial it down to where that curve tails out there. And where are we at? Right on 21.25. On the other side, let's go to about 50% up on that curve, right about there. Where are we at? We're right about 25.75. So the overall bandwidth is there. I just don't have that double hump pattern. So I need to go back through these stages again, and one of these must have been just slightly off. I think you saw how touchy these can be. So I'll uh, 
go back through these and use a frequency counter on each one and see if I can pin down where the problem is. Now, again, it looked and sounded pretty good just using these meters. So I would imagine for uh, most viewers that's just going to be just fine. But since I got all this equipment, I'd like to get it as good as it can possibly be. So I imagine if I get this response curve to be just like it's supposed to be, there'll be a, a slight improvement in the sharpness and quality of the picture. I went through all the alignment steps again and I found the culprit. It was A7 buried back in here. My RF generator must have just been off a little bit when I aligned this. So, just by tweaking it a hair, there we go. I would say that it's pretty darn close to that. So, now the last step is to move on to the RF and mixer alignment. Those are the trimmer caps. There's one here and there's one hidden back in there. And there's one other one, but that's really just in parallel with the fine tuning control and it's used to center its action. To do that, we need to do the sweep generator actually going all the way back to the antenna input. We're going to work with much higher frequencies now, from about 55 megahertz for channel 2 all the way up to a couple hundred for channel 12, or 13 rather. Now, most people don't have any analog transmissions anymore, and unless you got some kind of um, blonder tongue transmitter set up or analog cable, you probably don't really need to align all these. You're probably going to be just using channel 3 or 4 with some type of RF modulator. Uh, sorry, channel 3 or 4 down here. So I'm going to focus on those. So I'll rearrange my setup and continue on with this. I'd almost forgotten that as part of this alignment project I wanted to pull out some of my other sweep generators and give them a try. I think this is a great time to pause and do that. So I've pulled out the ICO 369 and set it up to sweep that same overall IF response. So I've got my leads going to that tube shield again and video output for the demodulator probe and so on. Just one little problem. I cannot get the sweep width wide enough to cover that whole range. The sweep width control here goes 0 to 10, and I think that means it's supposed to be able to do up to 10 megahertz wide. While this overall response curve is only something around 5 megahertz, 6 megahertz, so I should be able to cover it no problem, but I can only see about half of the curve at a time, so I, have to, I can see one side or the other, but I can't get the whole thing on the screen. But other than that, it seems to work fairly well. This has a built-in marker generator, so need, no need to use this. And there it is. It's fairly distinct, easy to see. And you can make it a lot bigger, too. Uh, so let's check out how all well that marker actually works. If you recall, this point right about here is 21.25, so let's put the marker over there and read the dial. And it's a little bit closer to 22 than 21.5, but not horribly off. Now, I've not gone through and calibrated this, so I suspected, I suspected it would be off a little bit. And the other side of the curve it should be about 25.75 right there. Let's see. And uh, that side's not off too bad. Uh, so, this probably needs a little bit of calibration and uh, figure out what's wrong with the sweep width, but otherwise it seems to work all right. I did recap and go over it, but it's still something not quite right, it would seem. Uh, next up, let's see, why don't I pull out the old Hickok 615 for one last drive. I say last drive because even though I spent some time on this and restored it and I think it looks really cool, it's huge, it's really really heavy and it just doesn't work as well as some of those more modern equipment. But I've pulled it out, powered it up, hooked it up and here's what I get. 
it's the best I could manage. Uh, it's a little bit unstable and it's nowhere near as distinct with that uh, pattern as I got with the other generators. Um, but that's basically the same curve there. And there's the marker which is also far less distinct. See that? It's a little blob right there. And this is way out of whack. This should be around 21.5, and I'm on 21 and a half. Or sorry, 24 and a half. And likewise, the other side, about halfway up, should be what 25.75, and I'm at about 26.75. Marker generators have been out of whack, and the curve just, you know, it just doesn't look that good. It's not that distinct. If I try to make the uh, the width a little less wide, it just uh, doesn't look any better, really. So, like I say, as much as I like it. Um, just doesn't quite work as well as the newer stuff. Let's see, I think next up we'll try this older wave tech. This I believe is from the maybe the mid 80s. Maybe a little bit newer than that. I'm not sure, but this I believe is from uh, sometime in the 70s. All right, I've got the WaveTech 1002 hooked up, and I'm pleasantly surprised. It's working better than I expected it to for uh, an older piece of equipment. Uh, here's the response curve I've got. Uh, looks quite nice. The one pip I've got on there right now is my Heath kit. I wired that in as a variable marker generator, just like I had with this WaveTech. One thing I didn't like about this right away, though, is that some of the inputs are on the back. The two scope connections and the variable marker all go into BNC connectors way on the back. This thing is really quite heavy and it's quite deep as well and it's very hard to pull this out and get back there. But otherwise seems to work just fine. Got the RF output going there, DMOD input going to the uh, video connector again. Controls are a little bit different on this uh, than the 1080 that took me a while to figure this out. A lot of settings for the sweep rate. So you can have it quite ridiculously slow. <laughs> That's the amount of time it takes to sweep from one frequency to the other. I mean you can go excruciatingly slow. I'm not quite sure why they even have it a setting for that. Uh, and there's a variable as well. So you got frequency here, just like with the 1080, it's kind of touchy. You just got one big old control. I believe this goes 0 to 500 megahertz. Um, so the outer is coarse and the inner is fine. Yeah, 0 to 500 megahertz. And here's the output level control. The outer is coarse and the inner is fine. These are for plug-in modules to generate a marker. I was lucky to get a few. Uh, it's possible to get one that doesn't have any marker generators at all. I'm not quite sure what this one's all about. It seems to make a crazy square wave pattern, like it chops it up. But these are easy enough to understand. One HAR is one megahertz harmonic, so you get a tick for every one megahertz. Just like uh, the setting on this guy. And 10 is for 10 megahertz increments. So I got my sleep going from about 20 megahertz to 30 megahertz. And the 50, I think, is for every 50 megahertz, but that's outside the range of what I've got on right now, so you don't see anything. And then, of course, I got my variable. So, but. Uh, this this control is a little bit uh, interesting. It's got a wide narrow like on the other one, so you can make your markers wide or narrower. And there's a size control. You can make it huge. Well, this is the interesting part. This is 
pull for tilt. If I pull this out, the markers suddenly go at a crazy angle. There is one reason, or one, uh, one situation where that's quite useful. There's actually a marker right here on the vertical upswing of this curve, and it's really, really hard to see. But if you tilt it, then suddenly you can clearly see that there's a marker right there. It's a bit distorted, but you, know, you can definitely see them better at certain angles. So overall, yeah, this is definitely a keeper too. Uh, the last one I have is that RCA I mentioned way at the beginning of this little series, but I still haven't quite figured out how to use that, so I'm going to leave it off with this guy. So, uh, yeah, I think I will stick with this for the main one and keep this as a very nice backup. Now I'm going to continue on with the uh, RF portion of the alignment.